Hebrews chapter 2. I'm preaching a message called Grace Came Down. Grace came down out of Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 10. It says, God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters, and I will praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I will put my trust in him, that is, I and the children God has given me. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set us free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. We also know that the son did not come to help the angels, he came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Come on, let's pray together tonight over the preaching of God's word. God, we lean in today and we ask you to speak. God, God uh, we didn't come here tonight out of ritual. We didn't come here tonight to hear from a man. We didn't come here tonight to just sing some songs. We came here tonight, maybe even subconsciously, because we need to hear from you. We need you to speak. We need the eternal, we need your perspective. And so God, I pray as you open up our minds, God, that we would be changed forever. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Uh, have you ever been irritated or annoyed when somebody wanted to help you with something? Come on, you ever have like those moments where somebody wants to help you do something and you're like, back off, I got it. Like you just, there's just like, there's this thing like somebody wants to like, you know, like lean in a little bit and they want to help you out. And for some reason, the more eager they are to help you out, the more you get annoyed. Like, I remember the first time I ever used jumper cables in my life. Um, I think I was about like 23 or 24 years old. I was about 23, 24 years old. I was relatively newly married. And, uh, and I remember, you know, we go out to one of our cars one time and, and our car, uh, one of our cars would not start. Would not start. So I went, okay, I know that there were these like cable things in which I've seen people use, um, in which you connect it to one vehicle that runs and you connect it to another vehicle that doesn't run and you can start it and somehow uh, the energy from this car gets into this car and it starts. So I knew that this was a possibility, okay? I knew, I knew that this was a thing. And so I, I told Christina, I said, hey, I think I have to go get jumper cables because my car's not starting, okay? And so I go to the store and I get the jumper cables and, and, and I come back. Now, um, my wife uh, grew up in Alaska, okay? She grew up in Alaska. So she kind of has that like arrogance that says, I am from the last frontier, I know how to do that and you probably don't kind of vibe, okay? Right, she, you know, she's like, I grew up hunting bears. You did not. I'm better at you than stuff, you know, doing stuff. And so, so, um, so, you know, so she was like, hey, do you want me to do it? And I'm like, no, I got this, okay? I can, you know, I can do this. And so I didn't know a lot about how to do this. But I knew two things. One of the things I knew was that the cars had to be side by side. I knew that. That was, that was one thing that I knew, so I, so I pull up the car that was running, like next to the car that wasn't running. And the other thing that I knew is you had to connect one side of something near the engine with the other car with these jumper things, technical term, somewhere near the engine. I knew that, right? And so, so I, you know, pop the hoods of the car, and Christina is just watching me with judgment oozing from her pores. <laughs> She's watching me do this, and she keeps asking me, hey, 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 do you want my help doing this? And I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm fine. And, and, and so I just start hooking these jumper cables up to random places. I just start hooking them up. I see a little spark. kind of freaks me out a little bit. 
And then, then I went on Google, and guys, you'd be so proud of me. After about 45 minutes, I got the other car started. <laughs> and, and, yeah, yeah, please clap for me, encourage me, build me up. Okay, thank you, cool. <laughs> Whoever over there that started that, Lord, bless that person, right? I was so encouraged that, 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 I, had, that I had done this. And, and, and I think all of us um, kind of have this feeling. And the reason why oftentimes we don't want help is because we want the feeling of accomplishment when we do it by ourselves. Like we love that feeling of going, no, because then if you jump in and then you do half the work, it's like I can't even really fully celebrate that I did this. We all have this kind of mentality inside of every single one of us that exists that is a I got this type of spirit. It is a, hey, hey, no, no, I, I don't want any help. I got this. In fact, did you know fair games play against this in us? This is how fairs make a lot of money off of us because all of us have this, I got this thing inside all of us. Like, come on, you, you ever went to like the strawberry festival? And, and, and you ever go to the game strawberry festival fan? And, 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 you know, you ever go and you play one of these games? And, and my personal favorite that kind of seems kind of impossible, but I still feel like I can do it, is the one where the bottle is kind of like turned over and you have to take like this little stick with a ring at the end and you have to stand the bottle up with the little ring. And there's always some like arrogant 17 year old that works there, right? And, and, and they're always like, hey, you know, you get two tries for $3 or 42 tries for $5. Okay, right? Because they know it doesn't matter how many tries you get. And, and, you know, and, and, and they always kind of demonstrate it for you, don't they? So what they do is, you know, he'll stand, he won't stand on the outside where I'm standing, but he'll kind of stand where he is and he'll just. And he's just standing up all the bottles as if to say, you can do this, right? And, and, and you'll try it and you'll try it and you'll fail and you'll fail. And like $58 later, you end up walking out of the fair with an overpriced, overstuffed animal that you want to throw away in two weeks. And you're like, where am I supposed to put this animal? We all have this, hey, I got this type of mentality. And this is kind of a silly illustration, but I think this attitude costs us a lot of pain in life. I think having this mentality to say, hey, I got this. I don't need anybody's help. I don't need any input. I don't need any other wisdom. I got this. I wonder how much damage you and I have done because right here, when we should have threw our hands up, we went, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. And we end up years later, and here's the reality. We don't got this. <laughs> and, and, and no matter what, all of us will come to that conclusion that we don't have this. What happens when you get to the breaking point and you realize that you don't have this? Uh, I grew up, I remember I went to the circus a couple times when I was a kid. And, and one of the things that always fascinated me um, was um, the lion, right? Because the lion would step into this huge cage and there would be one dude that would go into this cage with a lion, and, and, and don't you find it fascinating, like, whenever there, there's these, any sort of, like, circus or any sort of magic shows where they deal with lions or, or tigers, and then people, like, trip out when the lion attacks somebody? They're like, I can't believe this. The lion attacked the man. It's like, yes, of course, because he's the king of the jungle, and you got him in the MGM Grand. <laughs> of course. that. I'm surprised it took him 20 years. For that to happen. And so I was always shocked when, when this guy would just walk into this cage with a lion. And the only thing that this guy, that this lion tamer would walk into the lion with would be a stool. And he would walk in with a stool. And what's interesting is the reason why the lion would walk in, or why the lion tamer would walk in with a stool is that if ever a trained lion start to get, started to get uncomfortable and started to get aggressive, what the lion tamer would do is that he would grab the stool and he would kind of thrust it at the lion. And, and, and not as a means to pierce the lion or to hurt the lion, but, but he would do it because zoologists tell us that whenever there is like a multi-pronged item that is, that is thrust at a trained lion, what the lion will try to do is it'll try to focus on all four points at the exact same time and it will kind of render the lion in a state of paralysis because the lion is trying to focus on all the stuff. Can I just tell you, in life a lot of times, I feel like the lion. 
In life, a lot of times, man, I get up in the morning and I feel overwhelmed because I'm trying to be good at so many things. Because I'm getting up and I'm going, man, okay, I want to be a great husband and I want to be a great friend and I want to be a great pastor and leader and, and, and employer and, and I want to be a great son and I want to be a kind person and I got to get to the gym and I got to do all this stuff. And, 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 and honestly, you, at least I do anyway, I come to the conclusion that where I realize that I am not that good. You ever wish you were better at being better? I just wish I was better at being better. Like there are so many times I'm like, why aren't I better at being better? And the reality is, is, is that we, we, we feel overwhelmed because we're trying to do all this stuff. You know, uh, I have a really good friend. His name's Jason DeMeo. He goes to our church and we play tennis every week. He's my, he's my tennis buddy and... Uh, he's a really, really encouraging guy. And last Sunday, actually, um, after the message, he texts me, and he'll do this a lot. Um, uh, you know, he, he'll just encourage me and say, man, what a great message. That was amazing. He'll tell me what he kind of got out of it. And, and, uh, and last week, um, it was cool. He, he texted me, and he said, hey, man, great message. Man, Jesus, what an amazing, you know, what an amazing Savior. And he says, man, what a challenging person to follow. And what he was talking about is, you know, Jesus is challenging to follow, right? Because oftentimes his teachings are the antithesis of mine and yours knee-jerk reaction. In fact, if you ever know, kind of want to know what God wants you to do, just like whatever you think instinctively to do, do the opposite. <laughs> you might be somewhere on the right track, right? And, and, and he told me, he said, man, what a challenging person to follow. And I text him back. I said, not challenging, impossible. You know, Jesus isn't challenging to follow. Although I understand the sentiment, right? His teachings are challenging, absolutely. But Jesus isn't challenging to follow. Jesus is impossible to follow outside of the grace of God. Outside of grace infusing our life, outside of us accepting this free gift of grace. In fact, here's my point. My only point tonight is this, is that we couldn't get up to it, so grace came down. We, we couldn't do it. It's more than challenging. In fact, remember the disciples, because Jesus said, hey, you know what, um, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich person to essentially inherit the kingdom of God, to, for essentially a rich person to be saved. And this confounded and this dumbfounded the disciples, because they're like, if rich people can't get saved, it, who can, p people who can buy anything, if they can't get saved, and, and so they asked that, they said, wait, hold up, like, uh, we're confused. And then what does Jesus say? He doesn't say you have to become poor. He says, in fact, this is true of all of our salvations. What does he say? He says, with man, this is impossible. With man, salvation is impossible. It's not challenging. It's not hard. It's impossible. But what does he say? But with God, all things are possible. See, I, you and I, we couldn't get up to it. And so grace came down. And in verse 10... I love what it's communicating here. In verse 10, it says, God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. This is why, this is so important, Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. You ever felt like you were embarrassing somebody? Honest question, raise your hand. All the husbands in the room, please raise your hand ASAP. Cool, all right, all right. Come on, you, you ever feel like you were embarrassing somebody? I, I, in fact, this morning, um, I, I was talking with Christina up here in one of the rooms here just off the backstage, and, and I said, hey, I'm gonna share that, that story of when I embarrassed you. And instinctively, she goes, which one? <laughs> it's like, that's funny. <laughs> she said, which one? And I said, and, and then I explained to her the one. She goes, oh, yeah, that was, that, that's a good one. In fact, it, it happened when we were in college. Christine and I had just been dating uh, for a couple months. And now to help set this up, I need you to understand that Christine and I, um, we come from very different circles. And when we were in college, we were in very different circles. So, like, Christina was, like, hanging out with the kids that did homework. Right, a paper was due. And they just did it, you know, like, like she came from that crew, you know, that they, they would like hand stuff in and like, and, and like go to class, 
You know, like she, she came from like that crew, and and um, uh, and you know, she she was the kind of person that she was actually like the commencement speaker at her graduation, and I was just grateful to be at my graduation. You know, like. You know, we, we just came um, from, from very different circles. In fact, uh, one of the guys that goes to our church here, literally just now walking into this service, um, uh, he was walking in, he goes, hey, I met one of your and Christina's college professors. I, I met one of you guys' college professors. And he told me who it was. I immediately knew who it was. And I was like, that's awesome. He said, yeah, I asked, hey, do you know Andrew and Christina Gard? And I guess the professor goes, yeah, Christina was a great student. <laughs> what about Andrew? Christina was a great student, <laughs> right? And so, so because I was dating Christina, I was put in environments and circles that I was not accustomed or used to being around. And so uh, the week of Christina's graduation, um, one of her professors wanted to have her and her whole family over for dinner. And so I was like the new boyfriend. And so I came to this dinner. And now I came. Now, again, I didn't grow up like eating at a lot of college professors' homes. I don't know how you grew up. That's not how I grew up. And so I was there, you know, and I'm kind of hanging out, and, and, and the food's kind of like late and coming out. And so I start eating some of the food that was on the table. And, 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 and after, after a little bit, Christina starts kicking me. She kicks me under the table one time. And I was like, dang, girl, we just started dating. You're already trying to play footsies with me under the table. That's what I first thought. But then she kicked me again. I'm like, no, that's a kick. That is a kick, right? And, and, and I was so confused. Isn't it the worst when you're embarrassing somebody and you don't even know why? And that's what's going on, and, and, and we have the meal. I'm kind of confused, and we leave, and, and, and we're driving away. And she goes, I can't believe you did that. And I was like, I know, right? What did I do? And she was like, I can't believe that you ate the centerpiece of the table. And I was like, the centerpiece of the table? And she goes, yeah, that fruit that was at the middle of the table, that was a table centerpiece. And I was like, well, where I come from, when you put edible food on the table, we eat it. That's not my bad. That's your bad. Come on, you ever, you ever have those moments where you feel like you're embarrassing somebody? I have those moments all the time where I'm living life, and I wonder if, like, God is just, like, looking over the balcony of heaven, just going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, you ever feel like that? Where, where, where you're just kind of doing your thing, and you're doing your best, and, and it's like, but you're still, like, you're kind of like the, you know, six foot two, 12-year-old that's, like, still tripping over his feet, and you're like, I thought I'd be further along. I thought I'd be better at this. I thought I'd be more put together. I thought I'd be more polished, and, and, and you're living life, and you can just feel, at least in your own mind, God just going, there he goes again. Sure does have a lot of passion, though. He's got a lot of passion. We'll keep him around, Right? You, you, know, you know what I love this passage is because it says this. It says, this is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. On Resurrection Sunday, you need to know this. Jesus is not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed by you. He's not put off by you. He knew exactly who you were when he stepped into relationship with you. And so some of you, man, you, you just, you're kind of beating yourself up. And I just want to encourage you, like, let yourself off the hook. Jesus is not embarrassed by you. He loves you and he is for you. Jesus makes us holy, reconciles us to God the Father, and he is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And it's not just that Jesus isn't ashamed of us, but he's actually made a way for us. It is interesting. It says, and it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering a perfect leader. Now, Jesus is a perfect leader. Other translations use a word that, that I want to talk about real quick that I think is fascinating. It says that, Instead of a perfect leader, it uses pioneer. It uses the word that Jesus is our pioneer. In fact, here's what I love about pioneers. Pioneers are always paying the price, but they do it for the rest of us. Pioneers pay a price, but they do it for the rest of us. And I started thinking about uh, what attracts me to pioneers. What, what makes me look at the life of a pioneer and go, oh, man, that's, that's impressive. And I wrote down a few things. Number one, pioneers remove obstacles so we can experience their vision. Pioneers remove obstacles 
so that we can experience their vision. Every, every pioneer, right, Walt Disney World, right, Walt Disney, like, creates Walt Disney World, but, but he didn't just, like, breathe and it happen. He actually, like, you know, they had to, like, bulldoze some trees down, and they had to set the stage. And, and, and what did he do? He removed obstacles so that you and I could experience his vision. Uh, here's another thing that pioneers do. Pioneers pay for what they desire most. Pioneers pay for what they desire desire most. The Bible says that we are not our own, for we were bought with what? A high price. Pioneers pay for what they desire most. And number three, pioneers have their story told so we can follow their way. I'm so grateful that we serve Jesus, the pioneer, right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that, that he's not embarrassed, he's not ashamed of us. In fact, he makes a way for us. And then in verse 14, it goes on to say, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also becomes flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Anybody here, like, like we're all afraid of something, right? Like, like all of us have fears. In fact, when I count to three, I'm just going to ask you to yell out something you're afraid of, just, just, just for crowd participation. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Heard a lot of different things. I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what I am, am deathly afraid of, snakes. Let me see if you said snakes. Let me see your hand. You said snakes. Okay, cool. Right on. That is the correct answer, by the way. <laughs> that is the right answer. Like, if you're kind of like, oh, I'm kind of cool with snakes, you confuse me. Okay? Right? Like, like, snakes freak me out. The other thing that I find fascinating about fear is we tend to see whatever we're afraid of. We tend to see whatever we're afraid of. So what I mean by that is if I was just kind of hanging out and I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, I would immediately assume it was a snake. Immediately. Like, are, are you ever just kind of hanging out? Maybe you're going for a run, right? You're just kind of go, going for a run at Lake Hollingsworth and you see something move. You immediately instinctively think it's whatever you're afraid of. It's amazing how we see what we are afraid of. You know, when we were uh, getting ready to... Uh, launch Grace City Church. Now, I, I've never been one that is prone uh, to anxiety. I've never really been one that is prone to like sleepless nights. I just don't think I take myself that seriously. And, and so uh, I, I just have never really wrestled with that. But what was interesting is two months before we started the church, I started having a lot of sleepless nights. Like there was a stretch, like about a six to eight week stretch where I was, no exaggeration, probably sleeping about one to two hours a night. I, 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 just, I just couldn't sleep. I, I didn't know what it was. And, you know, yeah, I had quit my job to, like, start a new church. <laughs> Maybe it was that. But, uh, but, but I just, like, you know, I, 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 was just, I was just having these kind of, like, stressful nights. And on one particular night, um, you, know, uh, you know, Christine and I went to bed. It was about 1 in the morning. And do any of you at your house have, like, those little things on your doors? I call them the beep beep things. Right? Those are the things that when somebody opens up the door, it gives you a beep beep. Right? Anybody have that? Like you have that at your house? Like you kind of walk in and, and it gives you a beep beep. Well, um, I don't know if I like those things. Because to be honest, I don't know if I want to know. <laughs> I would just assume you take my television and just use my Netflix pass and go on your way. Just wake up in the morning, TV's gone. <laughs> All good. At least I didn't hear the beep beep. And on one particular occasion, when I was having one of these like sleepless nights, I'm laying there and I'm like half asleep, half awake, and I'm kind of laying there and I hear the beep beep. And I went, I think that was the beep beep. And I get up and I go out to our door of our room and I look out into our house. I'm like, hey, I heard the beep beep. Nobody said anything. Could you imagine? Like, I don't know why we do that. Because like, what if someone's like, I'm in here. <laughs> like, what do you do? <laughs> Anybody there? Heard the beep beep. Didn't hear anything. So I go to our bathroom. I don't know why this is. I go to our bathroom and I grab some scissors. It's a real story, people. This is my life, okay? And I grab some scissors. But I don't go out yet because I need my wife with me. So I go over to the side, to Christina's side of the bed, and I'm standing over her at one in the morning with scissors in my hand. And I, I push her, like, wake her up. And, and, and I don't know why. In fact, we were actually really concerned about this. For like two to three minutes, I could not articulate words. 
Not even joking. I'm, so I'm standing over her at like one in the morning with scissors in my hands, and I'm like, ha, ba, be, 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 da, get, get, be. Like, like I literally could not articulate words, and she's standing, and like she's laying down like. <laughs> and after about two or three minutes, I, I, I'm like, oh, like, I heard the beep beep, and we got to go check it out. You're from Alaska. <laughs> so she gets up. We walk into the house and we're checking rooms and I have the scissors in one hand, my left hand on her shoulder. <laughs> that one got me. Eh. Walking around. And if you ever had these kind of moments, maybe you're walking to your car and you're feeling kind of spooked, we'll say funny things, huh? Like, good thing I took that Taekwondo class when I was 14. Like, we'll, we'll, like, try to project this strength. We're like, you didn't know I had scissors in my hands, did you? And, and, and we're trying to, trying to project this strength. And I, I, think, I think, man, that is so true to life. I, I think there's so many times in my life and your life where we're trying to project a strength that, quite frankly, is not there. I, I, I think we're trying to, to, trying to project a strength that we know in our heart of hearts doesn't exist. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to project this strength to make people more impressed with us, for, to make people think we're more spiritual than we actually are, to make people think that we actually have it all together. And we project this strength, and all the time Jesus is going, you're not fooling anybody. In fact, if you were that strong, I wouldn't have had to die. And, and so you and I, man, we're walking around, and, and we are projecting this thing, and I, and I just want to like free you up tonight. Listen, you don't have what it takes. You're right. That thing inside of you that tells you, man, I'm not sure if I have what it takes. You are right. You don't measure up. But we couldn't get there. So grace came down. And, and the hope that you and I have is exactly what the scriptures say here is it says that, you know what, the only way that he could set us free was through Jesus. The only way he could set us free for all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now, this is not just talking about a practical death, but it's speaking to the fear of not measuring up. So when we step into relationship with Christ, we don't have to fear that anymore. We don't have to fear that anymore. In fact, Paul says, if I boast or brag about anything, what do I boast and brag about? My weaknesses. Because I know it's in my weaknesses that he's made stronger in my life. So the thing that we actually get to just let die in our lives is this need, this fear from not measuring up. I want to have the team come up because I want to finish with verse 16 through 18. Because it concludes like this. He says, we also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. You know, uh, I remember I was 17 years old when I first walked into a church. And when I walked in, it was crazy because there was this guy in his mid-30s, this crazy bald guy in his mid-30s that was just like going. Stop, don't do that. See, I know what you were thinking. And I walked into this church and I was like, wow. I want to be a part of this, the local church for the rest of my life. And right after the service, the pastor made a beeline right for me. He literally stepped off stage and then walked right towards me. Now, if I did that to you, you'd be concerned, right? Like if tonight, right now, I, I'm like, and I walk towards you. <laughs> you'd be like, he knows. <laughs> you'd, be concerned, you'd be concerned and rightfully so. I was concerned. He starts walking right up to me and I'm like, and he starts talking to me and, and we were having a conversation and I'd recently given my heart to Christ at an event and I started coming to his church and, and then him and I started hanging out. He, even to this day, he's kind of my lifelong pastor and became like a father to me. But one of the coolest things to me was um, later on that week, um, we, we started, uh, uh, we played basketball together. And I thought, man, this is amazing. Like th this pastor guy, like he's pretty good at basketball. 
And I just thought, man, this is so cool that he would like hoop with me and hang out with me. I, 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 honestly, I was, I was blown away by it. I was blown away by it. Then a few years ago from right now, I, I got to meet somebody that was, is like a hero in the faith to me. He's a giant in the faith to me. Been a hero of mine for a long, long time. And, and through a mutual friend that was really encouraging us to be a Hillsong family church, um, I got to meet now kind of our pastor, our covering, uh, Pastor Brian Houston, who pastors Hillsong Church. And I remember uh, we were hanging all, all night and then we were kind of in this kind of off, off kind of off room behind like a stage and we just talked until about midnight. And at this point, uh, our church was only about like three or four weeks old. There's a possible possibility about us being a Hillsong Family Church. And we were just kind of talking. I remember thinking, this is a giant to me. It's like a hero. Like, man, I can't believe I'm, I can't believe I'm like sitting here having a conversation with them. And now, you know, a few years later, um, I probably see Pastor Brian probably seven, eight times a year. And every time I see him, I always want to reintroduce myself. I always want to go, hey, it's uh, Andrew Gard, Grace City Church, like hey, Lakeland, Florida. Nice to meet you. Hey. Remember I did that, I think the second time he goes, Andrew, I, like, I know who you are. I'm like, I know I'm weird. I don't know. <laughs> Every time I see him, I want to introduce myself. You, you want to know what's interesting? Now, these are amazing men. These are my pastors. Amazing, amazing men. I'm grateful that they know my name. I'm grateful that they care about me. And, and I'm, in fact, I'm blown away by it. But you want to know what the reality is? Um, they're amazing men, but they're just men. They're just men. You wanna know what's astonishing? It's astonishing that the God of the universe would humble himself as a man and would get down in the dirt of your life and of my life. It's astonishing. By, by the way, Christianity is the only world religion where the thing that the God asks for, he also gives. No other religion where that takes place. In fact, other religions, it's people sacrificing for the God. In Christianity, it is the God sacrificing for the people. Can't believe we serve a God that would get down in the grassroots with us so that he could relate to everything that you would experience. So that there is no pain and there is no heartache and there is no hardship that you can experience where Jesus can't get down and say, no, 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 you know what, I've been there. I know what it's like to have somebody stab me in the back. I know what it's like to go through trials. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be tired. I know what it's like to be downtrodden. I know what it's like to be weak, but take heart. You couldn't get up here, so I came down to you. And if you know anything, and if you realize anything this Easter, it's that reality. Listen, you and I, we can't attain it. We can't do it, but grace came down. We couldn't get there, so grace came to us. So Grace City Church, here's one thing I would encourage us to exchange in this season, in this Easter season. And my prayer for us is that we would exchange it once and for all, but we would exchange it continually. It's this. Today, tonight, let's make a decision that we are going to exchange human effort for authentic worship. That we would exchange human effort for authentic worship. I can't tell you how many people I talk to again and again and again up in my office at Grace City Church in which trying harder simply has not worked. Come on, when have things gotten better by you just trying harder? I've tried it. But when you and I throw up our hands and surrender, and when we say, Jesus, I can't do it, I'm not enough, in fact, what? I'm being asked to do is impossible, but I know with you, you make all things possible. And so if you're with me, I don't gotta worry about focusing on all four things. I don't feel like I gotta be a great husband and a great leader and a great pastor and a great friend. I get to just lift up my hands and say, there is a God who loves me, who's for me, who makes a way when there is no way, and I'm gonna let the chips fall where they fall, and if I focus on that one thing, my eyes fixed and focused on Jesus. Everything else in our lives is a byproduct of that one thing. That's why the Apostle Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me, 
moving forward towards the goal with which Christ has called me. Grace City, we, we couldn't get there, but praise God, grace came down.